Boom. Recording in progress. And that's the intro to today's uh, episode of uh, Just DQ Podcast uh, with your host, the only person talking to himself. Sorry for that COVID cough. Uh, I don't have COVID. Uh, and uh, we are welcome to another episode. Uh, this time we have, what uh, are we talking about today? Uh, well, we're talking about a comic. Um, I'm going to be conversing with comics today. I think the last episode was a movie. Um, this time I'm going to try to record this and upload it as a video to YouTube uh, so I can embarrass um, myself and showcase my living inhabitants to the internet although no one will watch this so who cares uh so this next episode uh what are we talking about again oh yes 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 uh a 2003 a 2003 graphic novel uh an autobiographical graphic novel from uh craig thompson and the work is called blanket so here is the here's the front cover. As you can see, it's got a bit of a, a muted monotone uh, design layout already uh, with strong ink lines for characters. Uh, so yeah, here's the the I guess the front inner cover maybe and, and the last uh, the last page I think uh, giving you some words from other famous i say notable uh, graphic novelists artists writers including uh, neil gaiman uh, i wouldn't refer to jules pfeiffer or brian michael because i really don't know who they are but neil gaiman i'm a big fan of his work especially sandman i think i've done a review um a podcast on one of his other works uh, of sandman i think uh, a more up-to-date a more up-to-date story um now this particular graphic novel is produced by Top Shelf, as you can see. And again, the words and the art is done by the same person, Craig Thompson. Um, so here, again, are the chapters. And one chapter is called Blanket, or a blank sheet. I'm sure as a kid, you remember growing up with, uh, with your siblings and having to share rooms. Uh, well, this coming of age tale includes all of that and, and then some uh, it's a great coming of age story overall. And uh, with a, a quick search on this book and this author, you quickly find out that um, this story was quite impactful on the graphic novel genre once it was uh, published. And if you can just read that back cover already, you can tell that uh, this book was highly, and this story was highly regarded by the monoliths, the monoliths ooh, of um, of comic book writing and graphic novels in general. And here's a picture of the uh, the artist. Here he is, Greg Thompson. Uh, and this story is is quite a touching story, uh, quite a personal story, uh, shared by Craig Thompson. Very uncovering. I'm trying to get in some of these puns if I can. Get some punches into this podcast as we get started. So again, Blankets is an autobiographical, autobiographical graphic novel by Craig Thompson. It was published in 03 by Top Shelf Productions. Uh, and again, it's a coming of age autobiography and the book tells the story. Oh, look, we have a visitor. It's a person. Who can that be? I don't think they're gonna come back downstairs. <laughs> scared them off. Um, so it's an auto, uh, it's a coming of age autobiography, and the book tells the story of Thompson's childhood in an evangelical Christian family, uh, including his first love and his early adulthood. And uh, it kind of, you can partition this graphic novel into three parts. Um, of course, it would include his early childhood, his first love, and then his early adulthood. Uh, where the first two chapters really take the the biggest uh, the biggest foothold on the story. Now, as we take a look at and talk about this graphic novel, we'll try to tackle it uh, from 
from a variety of blanket layers, uh, starting from, um, I guess we'll start off with the context and we'll move on from there. Uh, so for today's episode, we'll tackle this graphic novel from a context to a subtext, to a text, to an intertext. Uh, let me return to that whiteboard though. Where's that at? Here we go. So we're gonna we're gonna tackle it from all these different angulars. Um, now, if we take a, a look at context, which is something I, I learned about while in university, is really helpful. Uh, we're gonna start off with the the context of the story, mainly just getting a frame, uh, a frame, uh, maybe historical setting, cultural context uh, to this author and, and what he's all about. And that'll give us an idea of where this story kind of comes from. So uh, as, a, as, a, as a general, just the big question that we're probably gonna have to ask ourselves is who is Craig Thompson? So who is this guy? Who is, who is the author of this story? Um, well, he's a pretty plain guy in terms of how he describes himself or how he envisions himself in the story. But if I'm gonna take a bite from Wikipedia and uh, make this, I guess, as simple as I could, um, well, he's a really big, uh, well, his family is a really big evangelical family. Uh, and they they were very devout, very conservative Christian, as you can imagine. Uh, they really were, I guess they were really fearful of sexuality and of, of sin, fearful of sin, shame, guilt, and, uh, and any other uh, thing or situation that might bring rise to that. And that, that eventually comes into really interesting uh, practical um, debates once he gets his first, his first love. And what is also interesting is how these same exact um, fears are also manifested in his trauma. His trauma is it somehow directs his his Christian beliefs in a way, because really it, it kind of frames his future beliefs. And of course his Christian beliefs would be something that uh, would, be, would be connected to um, his childhood, right? His, and that's the first, the first part of this book is his childhood. And that's like part one. So in part one, you get a bit of his childhood um, and you get his early traumas. Uh, and I think these early traumas are really the, uh, I guess, the, the anchor to why this book is so, it's really immersive um, in, the, in the way that Thompson is very, very devout to being honest about, um, about his life. Um, and as the context, his family is like a very small town. Um, I forget exactly where the uh what the setting was it was a very small town um america again right-wing conservative christians and um and that really puts a weight on his own beliefs and his own expectation of himself and what he expects of himself um as you can expect if you're a young boy that's been growing up in a family that's all about morals and ethics and just being being a good person uh you you might have very high expectations of yourself right and and how that might um i guess determine what desires you have in your own life and what you really want to accomplish so uh that really plagues our our main character um in this story and due to that, you get a really big conflict um, between what he wants in life versus what he fears in life. And that is going to rise up again throughout this story. And it does end up catapulting himself into really interesting discussions with himself 
um, once he gets his first love. And I don't want to spoil that as well. But um, that was a really big and I think a very important part of his his coming of age. Uh, and of course, this is a coming of age story. Um, and coming of age stories, they always predictably follow that Joseph Campbell um, kind of every man type of hero outline. Um, so we'll go from Campbell, coming of age, Joseph Campbell's um, theory of like the every the everyday hero, and that would be like the hero's journey. And those are really some really interesting ideas uh, to always play around with because um, once you kind of get the gist of what Joseph Campbell is saying, you really have a deeper appreciation for all for all stories uh, because you end up noticing the same flair uh, and the same tropes brought up again and again. And I, I will never claim that that's a bad thing. Um, I, I believe wholeheartedly that um, writing has to be inspired. You simply can't make something out of nothing. Uh, with that said, maybe it's in our blood. Maybe it's deep ingrained within our blood, what stories that we have, whether or not we consciously are like aware of them, or maybe we just like prop them up um, because maybe that's what we need at the moment. We need a really good freaking story to help us through the day. I mean, in, in all honesty, uh, uh, what do you call it? A story is basically a way to entertain or to teach um, very practical very practical ideas are ingrained in stories and somehow somehow they're even deeper um, once you once you get to communicate it with other people um, and, that, and that's the crazy part about blankets it's a very uh, personal story and Craig Thompson ends up I think um, without bringing the story down into like some sort of depressive state like uh like many other coming of age stories or you know non-fiction stories it doesn't it doesn't turn into like a, a giant sob fest um instead it turns into like this more uh, nuanced exploration of coming of age right what does that mean to uh to people to young people right because everyone has has to go through those those uh, volleys and and peaks and he does it through i think his most cherished memories um and his most meaningful memories in the story and i think that is really what ties in together and brings viewers in um now clearly in terms of the context uh, aside from the small town he is very, very much into art. Uh, this Craig Thompson is all about drawing and his imagination is, is obviously very, very vivid throughout, uh, I guess, his depiction of his childhood, um, as well as how he chooses to lay out the panels page to page. Um, and it really shows his, I guess, skill, uh, the skill that he has in art. And I hope to uh, bring up some of those images for you because some of them are just very, very trippy. And in the introduction, you get the conflict that uh, the author has between himself and his brother because he knows that his job as a brother and his responsibilities as a brother are all about protecting uh, your brother and some of the traumas that Thompson first encounters is failing to protect his brother or to be selfish um, and thinking about himself over, over the needs of his brother who is uh, of course younger than him. And in the beginning of this, you immediately feel the weight of responsibility and guilt 
when his brother has to sleep in the creepy part of the house, which is like the cubby hole. And uh, inside the cubby cubby hole, there's some crappy mattress, uh, snap mattress that his father uses as the bed. Um, So let's see what happens to his brother uh, when they both get in trouble for messing around during bedtime. All right, so uh, let me get. Oops, let me get that into a full screen. Uh, go back to that issue. Uh, so in the beginning, again, they get into a fight, and his dad meets them and basically uh, disciplines them. That's a word that we can always try to try to unravel <laughs> disciplining, right? What does that mean? Um, so here we go. So here they have the boys fighting, uh, and their dad, their dad notices it immediately. What's going on up there? Um, and then you see them pointing against each other, blaming each other, blaming one another. As you can tell from the shirts, these kids love comics. They they enjoy superheroes. Uh, most young boys do. Now, after all of this, as you can see, you know some of that evangelical. Uh, morality piercing through the screen and you know the heavy etching of the panel you know you get this sense of um weightedness right this morality of weightedness even visually you can see that through the size of the father so the art style still captures what it means to be a youth right how creative and imaginative you kind of see the world and what it means to you Obviously, it's oversized and a bit exaggerated in some parts. However, the exaggerations as he is a child still continues as he matures because some of the traumas are 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 very severe. Right, they run deep. Anyways, let's go back to some of the surreal stuff. Uh, so, as Phil, the younger brother, gets in trouble. Um, Craig gets to sleep in the bed alone now, but what happens to his younger bro? He gets sent to the cubby hole, which as we'll see here, becomes somewhat of a shadowy monster or raptor. Um, Now, this again is an example of some of the surrealistic panels that Thompson uses in the graphic novel. So let's get this here. So obviously this mattress is not a raptor and it becomes more realistic later on. But the more realistic it becomes, kind of the more sad, uh, the sadder the story becomes. And um, this example here gets continued throughout the novel because later on, uh, as I don't want to go too deep into because of the readership, but it's later revealed how his brother and himself were molested by their babysitter. And that extreme trauma, you know, as they were so young, definitely plays a big role in the shame and guilt that Craig and Craig Thompson ends up carrying throughout some of this novel. And um, eventually his brother and himself don't really talk as often as they were when they were younger. And drawing back to those types of uh, memories, you can kind of tell where maybe the friction or the distance and the, be- between those two siblings might have risen between uh, Phil and Craig. And so this, this wonderful you know, coming of age story um, then explores that middle section where you know you get into what his first love or who his first love was, um, as well as what um, or how those, I guess, early traumas ended up affecting uh, his, I guess, present relationship in his first love, and that that part was very interesting as well um, because he, you know. The guilt and the shame of being abused as a child ends up 
really complicating his own um, relationship with, I guess, his then girlfriend, uh, right? And uh, it, it became hard hard for him and Reina, uh, that's his ex-girlfriend's name, his first love's name, to, I guess, to, to be intimate uh, simply. Just, just the intimacy of it all becomes difficult and challenging for them. And in moments where it, there seems to be an opportunity to be uh, intimate, they have to hold back also because of their, um, their likewise religious background. So this story, as, the, as I guess I'm kind of making up, it seems to be almost like a dialogic, autobiographical like debate about the effects and impacts of a devout religious upbringing and how that can, uh, can create some type of tension or friction in your day-to-day -day life. And in this case, the day-to-day -day life is his first love. And in the end, his own spirituality and his own understanding of religions and ideologies. So Craig Thompson is, is I guess, your, your regular day-to-day -day type of comic book artist, right? A bit of a loner, uh, kind of feels like on the outside. And regardless of that feeling of being on the outside, he's never seemed uh, hateful or vindictive about, you know, the rest of the world. And he's always seemed to find his place just by, you know, in some ways appreciating himself, which turns out to be a great depiction of this, of what it means to just grow up. You don't have to always fit in, but, you know, it's good to try to find a community and then to really be okay with yourself. Um, so what more can I say about this graphic novel? Some, somehow I seem like I'm only singing its praises. Uh, so context, subtext, did we even complete subtext for this? Like, did I talk about a subtext? Uh, what would be a subtext for this, actually? So the context was kind of like the framing of the, the setting, um, the year, while well, grunge was a big thing during this period of time. And also apparently graphic novels were much more violent, uh, dark, and depressing. And uh, I think this graphic novel is one of the early examples that you don't have to make a graphic novel or a nonfiction that is depressing. Now, the text itself, this story, uh, as, as it is, it's, I want to argue that it's kind of a, well, Craig Thompson says that it's a letter to his parents and his family. So it does try to offer up a reason for the ending. So by the end of this graphic novel, our, our author has come to a conclusion and a much more, uh, a more mature and complex understanding of religions. Right. And that if you just read this as text, you get the hero's journey. So our hero of Craig Thompson, he journeys through his life um, at, at one point physically journeying. Right. He actually physically journeys. And according to the hero's journey, um, the hero has to uh, leave and escape regular life experience what it means to you know live in a different uh, more risk taking environment and then return home with some newfangled knowledge and trust me this graphic novel follows this formula not step by step but but pretty much it follows the same uh, design so home is where the trauma is and um, this would equal the, I guess, the pedophile babysitter, which is itself a horror uh, to any parents and 
probably, of course, his parents as they read this, this story as well. So the pedophile babysitter at home is where the trauma is. Um, and then the second part, so that's number one. Uh, I don't want to only highlight the fact that this is what's happening, but this is a, not a turning point, but a darker shadow of the story that plagues all, you know, future, or at least the future relationship that we do see in the story, which would be the, the, the text as well. But the subtext might be that uh, trauma as well as religion. Home is where the trauma is, and maybe another word could be like uh, dogmas, dogmas, uh, who let the dogmas out? Let's put that, who let the dogmas out and that will and that would be like another part of the first part of this story right the, so there's an emphasis on where the trauma is who let the dogmas out also um you know brotherly bonds uh, brotherly relationships there's also one of the bigger ideas that are that's present in um in the first part of the story and you know that's and that's like the the part where the main character kind of gets to experience their their old the world what the world could or what the world is and, and then it explores out and then in the second part um you have his first love with reina and in this case, you um, you see and visualize what is the outcome. What is the outcome when um, when desire meets lust? And I think this is one of the big issues in that second half is that he really wants to be intimate. But how do you do that when you know, you are afraid of that that type of connection because it's been it's been destroyed and toiled by by a predator, and that's what happened to his well his idea of desire and lust is that lust has turned into the main focal point of intimacy, and that, that's where. That's where, that's where the deepness of the second half lies. And uh, the relationship is so fresh and his own outlook on love was so pure that it's, a, it's very heartwarming and delicate second half. Um, and if you love love, then you'll like it. Now, the last part of this, uh, the, of this comic just deals with him and the end of that love and the return home. Uh, so this would be the introduction or like the, the, the setting up of the story. His first love would be his, his great escape. So this is his great, oops, I don't know why caps lock was on, his great escape uh, from evangelical family an exploration of love. Of love, love that is intimate, love that is vulnerable, love that is desire. And I guess I could put like sexual desire since one of the main concerns of being evangelical is to stuff that desire and feel bad about it. Uh, so yeah, so he ends up leaving his house, uh, leaving his home, in order to uh, date, basically date Reina, and uh, they they go out. Um, they he ends up living in Reina's uh, house during that time, and yeah, it's interesting. In the end, they they don't really work out. Again, it's his first love, right? Not his first and only. So it's not really a mist. A mystery that they don't end up together forever 
Um, so like this podcast episode, this has been a bit of a slow burn with lasting rewards. Hopefully, if this podcast doesn't force you to read the book, well, yeah, you should probably consider checking it out if you want to add it to your nonfiction uh, slash, I guess, nonfiction slash autobiography collection. So I'm just going to go through some of the pages. As you can see here, Raina, Craig, you know, they like each other. They love each other. Um, and the story does is awesome, right? It also deals with divorce, which I think is another interesting topic um, that could be brought up more in conversation. Just the idea that sometimes love does not work out for some reason. And in this case, in the story, you kind of see how these two adults, the, the mother and the father, how they just can't seem to communicate anymore. Uh, in their marriage. Uh, and I guess, let me just think, is there anything else that I got to mention about this? Mm, let's see. Oh, uh, so the story turned out to be a slow burn with a lasting rewards. Um, and as evident from Joseph uh, Craig Thompson's honest interviews, he doesn't withdraw his voice and experiential depth as he uh, exposes shadowy layers in his life, including those early traumas. Uh, so for some highlights, I guess the stream of consciousness art style uh, is very uh, reminiscent of Gaiman's Sandman novels. The art spills over from surrealistic to uh, realistic almost seamlessly. Um, there's an honest character exploration. This graphic novel acts like an almost open diary to his parents and the reader. There's this interest in trauma without being depressing. You know, it explores pedophilia, heartbreak, guilt, shame without depression. That's really hard to do. People always want to get depressed. <laughs> and it also intermingles biblical passages. Um, and the third part of this story, I mean, the Joseph Campbell um, hero's journey comes full circle. And what that means is in the third part, I'm going to move some stuff, actually. Let's move this up. Move this up. Move this up. Move this up. And move this up. Oh, shit. Move this up. All right. There it is. Okay. Uh, so the third part of the graphic novel and the Joseph Campbell hero's journey, um, the return home. So once, once uh, he returns home, uh, Thompson is a changed person. Yeah, he's changed, and that, that's kind of that's the that's the necessity of a hero's journey is that you have to leave, go somewhere learn something and then come back changed with a new perspective and definitely the third part includes a new perspective thompson reveals his changed perspective on religion he has basically removed all memory of reina except for one of her special items and in the last part he rekindles and reassembles his relationship, or at least according to the book, he shares himself with his brother. He discusses how childhood is almost like a, a disappearing cave, which is actually is a kind of a metaphor they use. And the third part, oh, we have two visitors. We have a doggy too. Look at him. So small. Uh, so yeah, so the last part is the whole, the metaphor of the whole. Uh, so as the adults, Phil and Craig reimagine and talk about their experiences with this cave and how every time they returned to the cave, it became smaller and smaller. And that's kind of like what experiences and memories turn into, to be honest. As you get older, the memory itself starts to fade away and almost become unreal 
um, in some uncanny way. But in any case, once he returns back home, Craig talks to Phil, and they talk about this uh, this shrinking cave, a cave that was once big enough to hold both boys, right? So here's the picture of them going into the cave uh, when they were when they were young. And then, as you can see, it's so big they can hold them up. Now, once they go back, the hole got smaller. And once they go back, the hole got smaller, and eventually it was gone. Right? It just became a field. And I, I feel like those that those parts of the novel that use metaphor, use imagery, use description to talk about how eventually memories and things that we consider all important can fade away and won't always leave that same impression or uh, imprint. Oh, shit. my cat's here. I didn't even notice that. I'm so quiet. Whitey, what's up? Yeah. Uh, so let me show you how that's also metaphorically shown. So in the last pages, you see his memory of him and his first love, and you see how that memory just ends up disappearing, right? Because that's what that's what happens in the coming of age. You just gotta keep changing, right? That's that's the goal. Uh, hopefully, not be static. Instead, be dynamic, right? So in the end, that happens. Uh, he heads back home. He's a changed person. He has a reinvigorated and uh, more, I would say, like fluid and nuanced understanding of religion. And that's how the novel ends. And I really recommend this novel to schools and classrooms, places where you can talk about trauma, um, talk about art as well, surrealism as a as a movement, I think is very accessible to students um, because it's not meant to be taken completely um, realistic, right? It's not supposed to be taken so critically. You can flu be fluid with how you represent things, be um, figurative rather than being literal, and really hold on to um, just trying to enjoy the creative process rather than the artistic outcome, you know, or goal. And this novel, let's, so we talked about some highlights, the stream of consciousness art style, the biblical passages that are included in order to justify his new transition and new perspective on religion. Now the low lights, uh, well, I guess there really are no low lights aside from it might be a bit of a slow burn. It might be a, a longer story that comic readers or graphic novel readers will generally will accept. Um, and I think once you get through that first chapter, I think you're already in it. So this novel has much to say about religion, uh, mainly in the way that it becomes a dialogue between Thompson and himself um, and his own changing perspectives on religion and its morals and rules. Uh, so this novel, again, because of its content and its primarily sexual content, it has been banned from many different places. Um, now, in October of 2006, uh, one resident from Marshall, Missouri, attempted to ban this book and Fun Home by Allison Fischdell from the city's public library. Mm. Now, as you can guess, supporters of the book's removal characterize this as pornography and, and express concerns that they would be read by children. Um, now, the library director defended the books as having been well-reviewed um, by reputable professional book review journals and characterized this removal attempt as a step towards the slippery slope of censorship. Now, eventually, on October 11th, that same year, Libraries Board created a committee and they removed blankets and fun home from circulation. 
Uh, the committee decided not to assign a prejudicial label or segregate the books by a prejudicial system and presented a material selection policy to the board. Um, eventually, these books returned to the library shelves. Uh, now, this also reminds me of a book that I did bring into a grade eight classroom. Uh, and the book is called uh, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexi. This book as well has been banned from uh, more than a few places, primarily because of its uh, exploration of sexuality, um, its theme of like alcoholism and violence. It's also a, a coming of age story, the absolutely true story or absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian by Sherman Alexi. Uh, this, I thought it was a very interesting and great story to use in the classroom because uh, I think sexuality beyond simply the scientific uh, or biological discussions of the topic of sexuality, there must be a discussion about the emotional part as well as the development of that desire, how it um, how it might present itself, what it means to, uh, I guess, consent and and connect with somebody on that uh, type of, I guess, relationship. It's a different type of relationship once you add in the sex. And I don't think that people are going to appreciate the fact that these books discuss um, what those effects could be and how the desire to be intimate, to be sexual with a partner can be something that is completely religious and completely spiritual and you know more than just an act especially one that you should be ashamed of or uh, ashamed of feeling so on the last day of school i was called in to the principal's office yes i got in trouble and <laughs> and the principal talked to me about uh, the book and um so apparently i didn't get into trouble in that i could have been suspended or investigated because clearly this was the last day of school. Uh, now, Sherman Alexi's book, like I said, dealt with sexuality um, and also included mentions about ma masturbation, which is the safest way to ever explore one's sexuality. Um, but of course, it makes people uncomfortable to discuss because people feel bad about doing that, even though I think majority of people have touched themselves. Yep, that's true. Someone right now is touching themselves and you can't do a thing about it. So whether it's Missouri or Toronto, uh, sexuality is not a comfortable issue for adults and children to discuss, uh, which is why I think that novels are an excellent platform to frame these discussions and conversations. So if you want to check out um, a list of other places that have banned Sherman Alexi's novel. Take a look at Marshall University's pages for banned books. And I think that's a bit unfortunate. Um, but in any case, with an eye to education, I would recommend Blankets for High School Classes from grades 9 to 12. I recommend The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Alexi for intermediate to senior classes. Uh, that would be grade 8 onwards. Uh, so. Let's just wrap up this podcast for today. Um, I'm still looking at this whiteboard, aren't I? Okay, let's take a look at that whiteboard. Uh, so for, uh, let me see this bad boy. Yeah, so it does follow the hero's journey. Um, so if you would like to learn more about literature and liter literary theory, take a look at Joseph Campbell, Hero's Journey. Uh, now, again, the context included the background of the author. The subtext talks about um, some of the deeper messages and themes. The text would be the plot. I think I discussed that through the one, two, three parts, uh, the trifecta parts of this graphic novel. The intertext would come from the uh, discussion on religion uh, that is excellently done in this story. Um, the author literally takes passages from the Bible and then uses that to debate whether or not his own views are 
questionable or whether or not the church is questionable or not God is questionable or not people themselves are questionable. And I think all of those questions are acceptable as an adult and as a, a person coming of age, you're going to have to grapple with the difficulties of truth and that everything, whether it be um, what is current, or what is in the past, or what could be in the future, uh, there is no simple answer to the, the difficulties of life and of religion and other institutions. And so it's always good to critically think about those institutions. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna end off right there um, as the final note. Um, again, this is a this is a award-winning graphic novel. I can't really say more than it's really just great to read and to um, step, I guess, step in step uh, with the author and what it means to grow up in an evangelical household. All right, this is just DQ with a more comprehensive comic book review. Hopefully you appreciate some of that whiteboardness and the um, screen caps, which are not screen caps, but the graphic novel. So I'm out. Have a good one. Take care of yourself. Take care of your loved ones. And I will talk to you or see you in some case sooner than later. Peace out.